Indeed, Allah Ta'ala did create man an ambitious being. From the cradle until old age, man is, in ever, man is ever in pursuit of more. More profits, more food, drink, clothes, homes, cars, land, knowledge, wives even. And that is because Allah predisposed us with a yearning and a craving for more of everything. And because Allah does not accept for us to remain immobile, unmoving, unchanging, stagnant, and therefore unproductive, where we fail in dispatching of our duty as vicegerents on earth, he instilled within us a yearning for renewal, where we're never satisfied with one single condition. Allah inspired in us a love and motivation to change things for the better, to raise living standards, to innovate technologically, to build and construct and to embellish our lives with the permissible adornments of this world. Hence why man strives for success and improvement in all his worldly affairs. These improvements, though, are aimed at conveniencing our physical bodies, which ail and age. They wither and wear away and eventually die and fade. And so Allah inspired to our spirits, to our souls, a yearning to draw near to him, a desire to break free and ascend above the confines of this worldly prison. The need for spiritual elevation can never be satisfied, can never be satisfied without revelation. Hence why Allah sent the messengers and the scriptures throughout the ages, concluded by the greatest of the messengers, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the greatest of scripture, the Qur'an. With the afterlife lasting an eternity, and this world lasting, or our lives in this world lasting 70 to 80 years, success in the hereafter is of course a priority. Because it is the real life, despite us not experiencing it yet. Allah Ta'ala said, وَمَا هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَهْمٌ وَلَعِبٌ وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانُ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ this worldly life is nothing but a distraction and a game. And indeed, the home of the hereafter is truly the eternal, or truly the, etern the real life, if they only knew. And so, it is the actual life, and it is the better life, as Allah Ta'ala said, وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى And indeed, the last, meaning the hereafter, is better for you than the first, meaning this life. Dear brothers and sisters, man is ever in a state of frustration, always feeling hindered and obstructed. Why? The causes of this condition are the shaitan and the nafs. The shaitan who constantly wants to bring us down by making us feel down. By making us feel worthless, by making us feel useless. The shaitan attempts to convince us that our aspirations and our ambitions are unrealistic. They're unachievable. He tells us there's no hope and that we should just give up on our goals. He'll say to you, you'll never be a successful businessman. You just don't have the connections or the capital or the acumen. He'll say to you, you'll never be a scholar. Because you're just a simple Muslim. He'll say to you, you'll never be an A-grade student. You're just a kid of a council estate in Tower Hamlets. He'll say to you, you'll never be a pious worshipper or hafiz of the Qur'an or a mosque goer. You're just a sinful slave. If he can't defeat you entirely, then he'll accept your failure to excel in this world in order for him to wait for an another moment of weakness to bring you down again. The nafs, or the ego, is lazy, gluttonous, and selfish. It will tell you, you're good. You don't need to work hard. 
If people don't accept you for who you are, it's their problem, not yours. You don't need to change for the better. You're perfect. The world needs to change around you to reflect your changes and your reality. If man succumbs to this defeatist call from the shaitan or from the nafs, he distances himself from all good deeds and fails to benefit others and himself, of course. The nafs represents the internal enemy with a twisted and conceited and sadistic nature. And the shaitan represents the external enemy with nothing but ill will and hatred directed towards us. Both enemies must be resisted and combated. Now no better time is there to tame the nafs and fight the shaitan than the month of Ramadan, my dear brothers and sisters. The psalm, the fast, weakens the nafs as it deprives it of its necessities, food and drink and intercourse. Thus, the spirit is more, becomes more alert. When the nafs is weakened, the, the, the soul is more alert, is more conscious, is more active against the enemy within who is now debilitated and, and is more capable of taming it. The shaitan's influence too is weakened during the month of Ramadan as the most rebellious shayateen are chained. Again, allowing the spirit some brief respite from the constant onslaught of prompts and suggestions from the shaitan. And so Ramadan, dear brothers and sisters, truly is a month in which we're taught, in which we're taught how to achieve our goals whether they are worldly goals or spiritual goals, and how to observe patience in seeing them through to the end. Before the start of the month, many people feel apprehensive and even have a sense of dread at the length of the fast. But this is just an illusion. Because if we compare the last day of Ramadan to the first day, we would realize that all of that fear and anxiety of not being able to function while fasting was merely a deception from the shaitan to make you not realize your potential. Ramadan has always been a month of victory for the Prophet's Ummah. Badr, or Hittin, or Ain Jalut, or Az Zalaqa, Allah Ta'ala has distinguished this month with the honor of it being the month of victory, and for good reason. Both the command to fast and the command to, uh, to combat any aggressor, these two commands were revealed to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the same year. Allah Ta'ala, he said, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ Permission has been granted to those who are combated because they have been dealt with, because they have been dealt with unjustly. And most surely Allah is able to give them support. And he said, He said, And fasting has been prescribed upon you as it was prescribed on those before you in order that you may attain taqwa. These two commands were revealed on the same year, dear brothers and sisters. Now the proximity of these two prescriptions is indicative of a deep and unfading connection between them and it is patience sabr fighting in a just cause of course uh, requires unwavering patience fasting is but an exercise of patience patience not to invalidate your fast physically by eating or drinking the patience to not spoil your reward of the fast by sinning as the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said if anyone does not abandon falsehood and action in accordance with it allah has no need for him to abandon his food and his drink the fast teaches us patience needed to control our temper and suppress our anger again the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said he said sallallahu alaihi wasallam fasting is a shield if any one of you is fasting, let him not utter obscenities or raise his voice in anger. And if anyone insults him or intends to fight him, he should say, I am fasting. 
Now, scholars noticed that fasting and patience have never been mentioned together in a single verse in the Quran, nor in a single hadith. Fasting and patience. And that is because they are one and the same. We all know the hadith in which the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, كل عمل ابن آدم يضاعف له الحسنة بعشر أمثالها إلى سبعمائة ضعف قال الله سبحانه إلا الصوم فإنه لي وأنا أجزي به Every deed of the son of Adam will be multiplied for him between ten and seven hundred fold for each merit Allah said except for fasting It is for me and I shall reward for it Meaning that there is no prescribed or assigned reward for fasting. It's unlimited. It was excluded from kullu amal. Every deed which has a set reward. Now patience is also rewarded in such a manner with no account. Allah Ta'ala, he said, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجَرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابِ Indeed, the patient ones will be rendered their reward in full without measure and so fasting and patience are essentially one dear brothers and sisters fasting is the cause of victory it is the cause for victory in this life and in the next success in this life and in the next because fasting erases sins and sins are what impede our success and victory and sins are what impede our dua from being accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the one who fasts their dua is accepted ثَلَاثَةٌ لَا تُرَدُّ دَعْوَتُهُمْ الصَّائِمُ حَتَّى يُفْطِرُ as the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam there are three whose supplication is not rejected and the first is the fasting person when he breaks his fast or until he breaks his fast both meanings are, uh, uh, are applicable my dear brothers and sisters Ramadan teaches us that whoever can temporarily abstain from food and drink and intimacy, which are all necessities we can't live without, can in fact endure any trial in life. Ramadan is a month in which we realize our massive potential and what we're capable of. Fasting during the day while you're at work or school or university. Uh, prolonged standing in salah at night after a whole day of fasting. Paying your zakah, the zakah on your wealth, or zakah al fitr Giving daily charities too. Volunteering to help facilitate the means for your brothers and sisters to pray, or volunteering for a charity. Or reciting Qur'an for long periods of time. All of this is evidence of how Allah Ta'ala has endowed us with incredible capabilities to achieve correspondingly incredible goals in this life and in the next. And thus, Ramadan exposes us to our strengths, which the shaitan and the nafs conceal from us in order to frustrate us into defeat, in order for them to frustrate us into defeat before we've even tried to succeed. So utilize this blessed month, which is upon us, dear brothers and sisters. Be aware of your abilities and strengthen them. Be conscious of your uh, 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 be conscious of how you observe patience which you'll need to recruit in all of life's endeavors you will inevitably face obstacles in all of your pursuits you will face obstacles you will fall over hurdles you will be diverted and delayed by distractions but with patience you pick yourself up you redirect yourself to your goals and you resume your journey we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made us ambitious to facilitate for us the means to actualize our dreams and to enable us to fulfill our goals and grant us happiness in both abodes. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على الحبيب المصطفى وبعد. My dear brothers and sisters. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is that he repeated the month of Ramadan for us annually. And that he made it a month. Not one day or ten days. He brings it about every year for his servants to recalibrate their gauges, renew their faith, 
reaffirm their covenant with him, cleanse their hearts, detoxify their bodies, reconnect with the Quran and many other lofty objectives that are intended for the believer. The believer is ambitious, as we said, and the believer must aspire to improve their condition from how it previously was. The believer should aim to increase their profit margin, should aim to increase their knowledge, should aim to increase their worship. The believer can accomplish this during the month of Ramadan, where he receives divine aid and assistance. But what about after the month of Ramadan? Too many of us have overly ambitious goals limited to the holy month. Once the month is over, we return to our bad habits, which, they them, which were themselves the cause for our failures. Ramadan offers for us an impetus to change, but not make temporary, but not for us to make temporary changes, to make permanent changes. So how do we use the month of Ramadan to make permanent changes in our lives? Broad and sweeping reforms, brothers and sisters, are not sustainable in the long term. Allah Ta'ala was able to create the heavens and the earth in not one day, but in an instant, in a moment. He could have said, Kun Fayakun, be and it would have been. But Allah willed that He create the heavens and the earth in six days, not out of a lack of means or power. Hasha, glory be to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to teach His creation a lesson, an eternal lesson, which is gradualism in reforms rather than sudden changes which the system cannot bear and so every Ramadan in our lives can double as an, as an intensive course to cultivate one single good deed and get rid of one bad deed a good deed that we will maintain throughout the year and throughout our lives inshallah but your target has to have has to meet three conditions your target for Ramadan must be defined. You must know what it is that you want to achieve this Ramadan and maintain throughout the year. Your target must be attainable, something you can, you can accomplish. And you must provide the means to help, to help achieve your goal. And of course, to seek Allah Ta'ala's aid and assistance to help you reach your objective. Once you know what it is that you want to achieve this Ramadan, you have to work for it. There is no other way. Dua alone is not sufficient. Allah Ta'ala, He said, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا But whoever desires the hereafter and exerts the effort due to it while he is a believer, it is those whose effort is appreciated i.e. by Allah so what good deeds can you aim to include in your repertoire of righteous acts of worship which you offer to Allah sincerely you may want to uh, ensure that you pray the rawatib which are the sunnah prayers attached to the fard prayers you may aim to pray you may aim to uh, 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 to pray duha every single day you may aim to say the adhkar of the morning and the evening every single day you may aim to recite a portion of the quran every single day you may aim to give a charity every single day you may aim to pray qiyamul layl every single night even if it's just two units of prayer these are just some examples of some of the good deeds that we can add during the month of ramadan with the primary intention of maintaining them permanently forever don't do what other people do do what works for you do what you can commit to don't take on too much because you will set yourself up for failure and failure during or after Ramadan can have a devastating impact which is what the shaitan wants he wants to fill you with despair oh there's no good in you Ramadan didn't work and and no month will work with you and so Take on what you can bear, what you can fulfill, what you can maintain. And to help you achieve these goals, you must know the significance of the good deed you want to cultivate in your life. 
and foster as a, as a, 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 as a daily practice where it becomes habitual. You don't have to think. You do it habitually. You need to know the significance. If you don't know the significance of this good deed, then you will take it lightly. You'll belittle it. And so take, for example, praying the rawatib, praying 12 units of prayer during the night or the day. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, whoever persists in praying 12 rakahs each day and night will enter paradise. Allahu Akbar. Will enter paradise. It's that simple. Four before dhuh and two after. Two rak'ahs after maghrib, two rak'ahs after isha, and two rak'ahs before fajr. What about praying in jama'ah? I want to start, I want to use this Ramadan to uh, foster the practice of praying jama'ah all of the time. All of the time. Whether it's in the mosque or whether it's at home. I pray jama'ah. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said the reward of the prayer offered by a person in congregation, in jama'ah, is 25 times greater than that of the prayer offered in one's house or in the market alone. What about charity? Or uh, being pleasant-natured, keeping good family ties, praying some prayers at night. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he entered Medina, one of the first things he said, as Abdullah ibn Salam narrated, he said, Ya ayyuha nas أَفْشُوا السَّلَامِ وَأَطْعِمُوا الطَّعَامِ وَصَلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامِ تَدُخُلُوا uh, وَصِلُوا الْأَرْحَامِ وَصَلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامِ تَدُخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ بِسَلَامِ He said, O oh people, spread the greeting of peace. Salam. Feed others. Maintain family ties. And pray during the night when the people sleep. What will be the result? You will enter paradise with peace praying duha for example most of us are working during during uh, duha and so it's a neglected sunnah but just two units the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said in the morning charity is due from every bone in the body and every one of you every utterance of allah's glorification is an act of charity to say subhanallah is an act of char charity to say uh, 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 to the, the, the shahada to say la ilaha illallah is an act of charity and to say Allahu Akbar is an act of charity and enjoining good and forbidding evil are acts of charity and two rak'ah, two units of prayer which one prays in the forenoon will be sufficient two units that will cover the debt that you owe or the charity that you owe for every joint in your body and for every bone and as for the recitation of the Qur'an, and there is no reward parallel to it. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, whoever recites, whoever recites a letter from Allah's book, then he receives the reward from it. The reward of ten, the like of it. Multiplied by ten automatically. I do not say that alif, lam, meem is a letter. But alif is a letter, meem is a letter. Uh, alif is a letter, lam is a letter, and meem is a letter. And of course, the one who recites regularly will eventually become what? Will become fluent and proficient. And he said, the one who is proficient with the Qur'an will be with the noble and righteous scribes, the angels. And the one who reads it, okay, you struggle, you're not proficient in reciting Qur'an. The one who reads it and stumbles or stutters and finds it difficult will have double the reward. The reward for recitation and the reward for trying. But, of course, I remind my dear brothers and sisters, you can't keep trying your whole life. You, you must apply yourself in order for you to become proficient at some point. What if you struggle to do any of these good deeds? Does it mean that you should give up? Does it mean that your Ramadan was a failure? No, of course it doesn't. Because what is prioritized over performing these deeds which... None of what we have mentioned is fard, is obligatory, by the way. What is prioritized over these nawafil, these supererogatory deeds, is for you to cleanse and remove from yourself any, uh, uh, any foul traits, any blameworthy characteristics, which themselves, which they themselves, are what prevent you from performing the good deed to start with. 
the, 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 the Salihin, the righteous of the past, used to say, At-Takhliyatu qabla At-Tahliya. Takhliya is to empty, and Tahliya is to beautify. Meaning, purification before beautification. No doubt all of these righteous deeds beautify the believer in the sight of his Lord. And, of, and also in the sight of the believer's eyes. Yes? But the impurity within does not allow for these good deeds to coexist. And so we must rid ourselves of them. Because they are what are preventing us from excelling with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this Ramadan, number one, you must work on eliminating your major sins. It may be that you have to lower, you have to start lowering your gaze. Or that you control your tongue. Or that you restore to people their rights. You took money from somebody. You borrowed money from somebody. And you didn't give it back. You have land back home which you claim is yours. And you fabricated paperwork to falsify uh, uh, records. Restore to people their rights. Or else Ramadan will do nothing for you by the way. Then work on removing these blameworthy features which a Muslim must never be characterized by. You may need to eat less, sleep less, spend less time with people. al fudail ibn Iyad, he said, two, two uh, characteristics harden the heart. Sleeping a lot and eating a lot. And Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, mentioned five characteristics which cause the which cause hardness and harshness of the heart. And they are spending too much time with people and having excessive hopes in people and being connected to those, being connected to anything or anyone other than Allah and filling the stomach and sleeping too much. You must combat your laziness. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would seek refuge every morning and every evening from al ajzi wal kasal incapacity and laziness <clears throat> talk less Umar radiallahu an he said he who speaks much errs much and he who errs much has little modesty and who and he who has little modesty sins much and the one who sins much enters the hellfire and we seek refuge in Allah from that you may need to laugh less it doesn't mean that you live a miserable life it just means that you should apply some more seriousness Laugh less. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لا تكثر الضحك. He didn't say, لا تضحكوا. Don't laugh. He said, لا تكثر الضحك. Do not laugh excessively. Don't laugh a lot. فإن كثرة الضحك تميت القلب. For excessive laughter kills the heart. Play less. Watch less TV. And get off social media more often. Dear brothers and sisters, Beware of the ploys of the shaitan who will tell you, is that it? That's all you want to do this Ramadan? This is a trap. He attempts to deceive the believer by making the believer belittle the good deed. Belittle the good deed. This Ramadan, I'm going to start by, I don't read Quran at all during the year. So this Ramadan, I'm going to read a page of Quran every day and that's what I want to stick to the, for the rest of the year. Shaitan will come and say to you, just one page, is that it? Hey, you're supposed to finish the Quran in Ramadan, do, do a juz. Yes, that is a trap, dear brothers and sisters. Because he wants you to fail. And when you fail, you despair. And when you despair, you never attempt again. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to Abu Dhar, لا تحقرن من المعروف شيئا ولو أن تلقى أخاك بوجه طلق He said to Abu Dhar, do not belittle any good things. Don't belittle any good deed. Even if it is that you meet your brother with a cheerful countenance, with a cheerful face. And so, if all you can improve this Ramadan is your smile, then that is an accomplishment that you have attained. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to extend our lives to witness the month of Ramadan. Nobody knows if they will live for the next week or not. And we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our fast and to accept our prayer and the recitation of Quran and our charities. And we ask him Jalla Jalaluhu to grant us the strength and the ability to achieve these lofty goals which he has, uh, which he has made as hallmarks of the believers. And we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to assist us in reforming ourselves permanently and to accept from us and to shower his mercy upon us. Uh,
هذا وصلوا وسلموا على خير الأنام فإن الله أمركم بأمر بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملائكة قدسه ثم بكم أيها المؤمنون فقال جل من قائل إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين وأذل الشرك والمشركين وأعني بفضلك كلمتي الحق والدين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغض يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون وأقم الصلاة